It was quite the highlight of your life, the Glen Cinema, because you didn't do much really in Lawsville. You went to school, and on Sundays you went to Sunday school. Sometimes you went to the evening service, and you went out for a walk in the afternoon, but you went to the cinema. And they had the little programs, you know, and the, the people in town advertised. I think well, there was two shows a week, you know, different films. Saturday nights was a night I remember most vividly because the whole family used to go. You know, I used to look forward to that very much. Well, it was always in before. We never had anything else in those days. End of the war and in the 40s. Saturday was the normal time you would go. I think Friday evenings they did a fair trade as well. But uh, there was no television then. Hardly anybody had television. Now, Mr. Williams would be standing around the front door. Mrs. Williams sold the tickets. They were Scottish, Mr. and Mrs. Williams, very heavily Scottish. And that was their life. I mean, they were dedicated to the cinema, and, and that was it. And then when the cinema closed, he, he couldn't, they couldn't sell it. So he converted part of it into, his, uh, into a home. He built the house himself. His workshop and work tools and everything was, he was, that's what he did. You know, very solitary man, very clever, but he ran the cinema from its birth to its death. It's interesting, when he converted the cinema to a house, so the entrance was where he used to go in to buy the tickets, but he built the house on props inside because inside it all sloped downhill and the original sort of angled concrete base was still in there but there was room to get two or three cars in the, the stage end and the stage was all still in existence down there so he would use the main door to park his vehicles at night time so that's what he did uh, and unfortunately because it fronted straight onto South Street that if it was heavy rain it, the water would pour in there that's why he perennially kept it swept. Of course, during the war, all the soldiers were here, and if you wanted to get a seat, you had to get very early. And I've seen them queued all the way around the block back in those days. Well, they used to be queued up from the entrance yes. to the cinema to the archway, you know, Saturday nights. Yeah, especially. you had to get down there early. Yeah. The cinema would be packed out because there were British soldiers, German prisoners of war, lots of Americans, and evacuees. During World War II, we met many evacuees from London and some from Plymouth. And they were all scathing about the lack of things to do in there. And one of the highlights of the evacuees' lives in London seemed to be the opportunity to go to pictures whenever they wanted to. So after the war had ended, the local youths decided to try a Saturday night visit to the Glen. So collectively, we arranged to meet at the post office with our bikes and cycle the three miles to Lost Wickham. We all enjoyed the freedom and adopted the outing on a regular basis. I was 15 before I was allowed to go to the late house on a Saturday. I was allowed to go to the cinema on my own. If the programme was a A quality film, it would be a bit naughty and you hadn't, couldn't go in on your own, so you had to find somebody to go in with if I stand with you, and they'd let you in. It was a well-known fact that the fleas were shared down there. If I got bitten by a flea, I'd come up in a big lump, and Mother would say, you've got a flea again. Well, I can remember Mum taking me when I was about oh, 11 down there. She used to take me to what's in wildlife, you know, just for a treat. I think they used to have a film Mondays for the first part of the week, Thursdays for the second part of the week, but there were two different films. Well, you show whatever was there, you know, if you wanted to night out. Like. <laughs> <laughs> the first seats were out for the children, right in the very front. They were nine feet, and then as you went in the middle of it, like most people were there, that back. was one and sixpence. And if you were really rich, you went in the back, Half a crown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the back seat, yeah. half a dozen uh, rows yeah. there, but or and you had one or seats. two double seats there. We spent the nine minutes more than anything. You were speaking <laughs> yourself. <laughs> uh, we used to sit down the front, 
I think when they closed, I think it was ninepence for the front seats. And then behind that was the one and twos and then the half a crowns. Normally the kids used to sit in the front, so it was cheap, it was eightpence. And I remember the day that it went up to ninepence. Myself and my friend, Peter Thomas, who lives in the town, we went down at the last minute, ran down the hill, go into the cinema, and they said, no, I'm sorry, it's gone up a penny, it's ninepence. We had to run all the way back again to get a penny to go in. There would be very few people in the half a crown seats. There wouldn't be many back there. Mother and father wouldn't let me, they'd go in the six pennies. Because you were in the six pennies, you were out in the front, and you was up looking like this. So I was back in the nine pennies. The nine pennies were children, children for the adults. Even for the cheaper seats, they queued, you know, there was queues and that. I remember the boys turning around now, because we used to sit in the middle, and I always sat there in the front two or three boys and stuck all the paper back up and just you know. I used to pick out my films what I wanted to see, or we were told that it was good films. Well, we always had the cowboy ones. That's what we youngsters would like, the cowboys. Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and Gabby Hayes. You had a few detective ones. Of course, they were all black and white in those days, and everything was lines going down across the film. And Father took me one day, because Robin Hood was being shown. And I would insist on taking my Robin Hood book to see if it was the same as the film, but it was an American Robin Hood film. I remember an old Rasky film about ghosts, which terrified me. And when I went to bed that evening, I found it very difficult to get to sleep because there were owls calling in the trees opposite my home and of course I thought they were ghosts. The ones I remember most, Lauren Hardy and like Abbott Costello, George Formby, and then of course there was Tarzan and it was a varied program. My father would smoke a pipe and my brothers would smoke cigarettes and that, and you know, it was a bit of a cloud there sometimes. I first went to the Glen in the 1950s. It was my first visit to a cinema, and I went to see a kid for two farthings with David Kossoff, and I thought it was marvellous. And I also remember seeing a film with Debbie Reynolds in it called Tammy, which was a musical. There was always two films, you know, there was the B film and then the A film. There's lots of cowboy films back then. You know. The popular ones were like Blue Murder at St Trinian's and all those, you know, the, the wacky school type, Jimmy Edwards type thing. And all us kids used to love going to them. I remember going with my brother. My brother was three years younger than me. They had Pinocchio and uh, my brother was only a little boy. He was only about four. And Pinocchio told lies and his nose grew and his nose grew and Pete cried. <laughs> the following week we went and it was Jonah and the Whale and Jonah lit a fire inside the whale. He was in the belly of the whale and he lit a fire to keep warm because my brother cried so much, my dad had to take him out. <laughs> he was worried about the whale having a fire in him. <laughs> As a family, we didn't seem to go to the cinema very often. My brother used to reckon it would upset her eyes. And because of that, I didn't go. The first time that I can recall going was in the war years when the mayor was called Spencer Brown, and he had an afternoon for the school children, both for some Winnow and Lost Video, to go to uh, the cinema, and we saw Sabu. And he's in black and white, and was Sabu was sitting up on the side of a tree, and all of a sudden this enormous tiger frightened the wits out of me, it really did. I didn't go for ages after that, I thought that was all about. Yeah. I can remember the films breaking, and then the cinema would go, Oh, <laughs> and then it'd be a few minutes and they'd be sticking them back together and they on again, yeah. Every now and again, the film would break. And that would be eruption then, you know, uh, would be very noisy until that's all repaired. Did happen quite often. <laughs> so that caused a bit more fun. But I can remember wearing wellies to the cinema because the high tide, when you come out, you could be water in the street, the rain would come down, the tide would come up, wind up the river, parade would be flooded. The main usherette was a lady called Minnie Ruse, who sort of everybody knew. She always sat up on the top corner and was knitting. 
and uh, if there was any noise apart from regular laughter or something like that, she would go down with her torch and she would go, shh, you boys, shh. You know, it might have been girls as well, but I mean, uh, it was always you boys. When the film was on, if we started to talk, she used to say, you children, be quiet, be quiet. You mustn't talk. But she sat right behind us and she always used to bring her knitting. So when everything was quiet, the film was being shown. We could hear her knitting needles click, 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 all the way through the film. And you couldn't save her blue smoke. That's where we learned to smoke in there, youngsters. In the dark, though, we could see in there. Except seven many roofs. Come on, you boys, you mean you're smoking. Come on, come on, come on. She was a character. She used to, she used to show you your seats and keep order amongst the yeah. children. And how yeah. she could knit in the dark, I do not know, but if they misbehaved, the light would be shone on the kids in the front. <laughs> Yeah, she was a real character, she was, with her little French cap, like, you know, with a little bubble on top. She would be going down there with the torch and shouting, now, at that time, you quieten down a bit and that, but, you know, that all added to it, didn't it? <laughs> she uh, managed to keep the places sort of, you know, running and very respectable, I think. But did get away with all sorts, I'm sure, in the back row, for the notorious. You uh, made noise or did something at your peril, as far as she was concerned. She was quite tough. They didn't have any ice creams at all till later when they had a deep freeze. They didn't seem to give Minnie Roos a tray. She served them from Kelly's tins um, in the corner of the cinema. And I remember we thought that was a great advance, really. Minnie Roos, who sat three seats back from the back in her berry and her John Lennon glasses, she was knitting. And what we used to do, we used to sit in the front seats and the lights would go down and we'd gradually climb over the seats and work our way back. And then she'd come down with the torch and shine it right in your face. <laughs> you boy, you don't belong there. You were down in the front. <laughs> go back then. Yeah. And she used to walk back around and go down the front and walk back up. And you lot there, stop that and sweet papers. And you lot there, start canoodling in the back. You could be good, you could be good. And she'd be a bit great in her voice. <laughs> Yeah, they always had the patty news, you know, of what was going on, and always had the cartoons. They were always very popular. <laughs> Pathé news would come on, but it'd always be news that was like two weeks old, and they'd have a football match. You already knew the result. You would hear the news on the radio, but you wouldn't see it on television. But if you went to the cinema, you'd get snippets of, you know, propaganda and sport. And it's like that for 10 minutes on Pathé news. And the cockerel would crow. There were times when it showed shots of the wartime prison camps and the awful, awful piles of bones and bodies and things, so I was told after. But we weren't allowed to sit in the cinema and see it because it was too gruesome. And Mrs. Williams would bring us all up outside, all the children go outside, and we would stand up on the top of the steps, try to peep in through a crack in the door. <laughs> and then when it was time to go and the curtains went across, the next thing that happened was the national anthem. The film was the end and then it would, there was a crescendo of noise and gods, and everybody would stand. You see that today, can you? <laughs> It'd be gone. At the end, when the national anthem was played, some of the young children and people would get fed up with waiting, so they used to dodge out behind and go down the back of the main entrance again. Mr. William, the owner, he wouldn't undo the uh, exit doors until after the national anthem had finished. So you had to sort of stand there. And then there'd be an absolute rush to the chip shops. We lived in number two, Church Street, which faced the back of the cinema. My friend and I used to sit in the window seat and open the window and we could hear the film being played inside the cinema. After the film finished, the doors were opened and everybody came out. You used to go up the steps to go in the cinema and then they would throw open the big doors onto the, the church lane, you know, to come out. There were lots of people around when the cinema uh, finished. There were often dances in the drill hall and various people in the family would meet up to get a lift back up the road. And uh, after the film finished, and the Queen, of course, came in on horseback, 
everyone seemed to dash for the chip shops. There were two chip shops. There was Varkos, which is where the flower shop is now. And then there was Tinney's, which was in North Street. You could go in before to Mrs. Varko anyway, and you could order a piece of fish and six penny worth of chips or something like that. And they'd have it all sort of ready for you, you know, like on the side, and then you wouldn't have to wait. As soon as the film stopped, everybody would rush out and go down to the fish and chip shop. <laughs> And back then, there wasn't much fish because it was wartime. So you got to like battered slices of potato and they did it like a fritters, you know, because you're glad to get it because there wasn't much meat, really. Back in the, when I'm talking about, they were called tinny. And she used to do lovely potato fritters. They were a penny. Mother would bring us home and she'd have a piece of tissue paper over the end of the torch because you didn't have a strong light around in case them on the sky saw you. It's because of the blackout, you weren't allowed to have flashing torches. But... They would have uh, some good films, you know, uh, towards the end. You know, they, they competed very well with other places because when television came along, well, that was the end of the story, wasn't it? You know, that's what was the demise of all the small cinemas in little places like Los Williams. Lovely lot of memories with the place. 